ARK has recently expanded its choice of funds to include a new ETF called ARK-X, and this is the Space Exploration and Innovation ETF. But it's been a bit controversial in terms of the stocks which it's chosen. So in this video, we'll look at some of those stock choices to see if they make sense, but also whether they're likely to perform well given the current macro backdrop. Now remember, if you do want to learn more about investing, a great way to do that is by signing up for our free weekly market roundup. You'll find a link to that in the description below me and beside me. So now let's look at Arc X in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. So here's the description of Arc X on the ARC website. And you can see the primary goal is to give you exposure to space exploration. That's the exciting part, including orbital and suborbital aerospace. So orbital would be things like satellites which remain in orbit, and suborbital would be things which just get you up almost into space and then back down again. And this is the bit where it gets a little bit controversial because it also includes companies which create enabling technologies, but also beneficiaries of aerospace activities. Now, of course, there are many companies which benefit from aerospace activities, and that could include farm machinery, internet access, global positioning system, construction, and imaging. And that very broad set of definitions for qualifying companies is where all the scepticism has come from. So here's one example of that scepticism, which is Jim Cramer talking on Mad Money. And the actual segment was about why growth stocks have underperformed since February. And of course, ARK is no exception. ARK is the most growthy of growth funds. So of course, it's been completely hammered since we've had this rotation away from growth and towards value at the beginning of 2021. And here he's outlining his reasons why he thinks those growth stocks are now underperforming. For example, he says one look at the newly launched fund tells you everything you need to know about how managers can't resist creating new funds, even if there's no reason for them to exist. And his point is not unreasonable, which is that there aren't enough space stocks to make a reasonable ETF. And he says the manager wants to collect that 0.75% expense ratio, which is fairly expensive, and maybe don't launch a space ETF if you have to pad it out with Netflix and Deer. And there has been some good-natured ribbing of ARK because of the fact it's bought stocks like John Deere, which, if you're not aware, makes things like farm machinery. And here's the actual John Deere account showing one of its tractors being beamed up into a UFO. And in no time at all, there was a spoof account, the John Deere Space Agency, which is talking about Gary here, who's just completed his 40-week intensive JDSA training. And apparently, Gary has the ideal astronaut body. Another stock which surprised a lot of people, including Jim Cramer, was Netflix. Some people were joking that it might be boring in space, so you might want to watch a few of your favourite shows while you travel to Mars. But as we'll see in a moment, there is a justification for having Netflix as part of the fund. So now let's see if we can make sense of some of those stock choices. Here's the list of 39 stocks which form the fund. And as usual, you'll find all of this on ARK's website. They're completely transparent and they'll update this on a regular basis. And of course, that's one of the reasons why I love ARC. It's the transparency. And here you can see at number 13 is Deere, which is the manufacturer of agricultural equipment, but also some companies which you might not expect, like Amazon and Alphabet, which is Google, and number 26, which is Netflix. One of the fund managers appeared on CNBC, and they gave this breakdown by sector of the various stocks in the fund. Now, what people were expecting from the fund was just two of these sectors, the orbital aerospace. So that would be things like building satellites or building the launch systems to get those satellites into orbit. Or you might think of something like suborbital aerospace. But a really big chunk of the fund, 40%, is in just companies which benefit from aerospace technology. And 25% are the technologies which create the ability to have an aerospace industry. So now let's look at some of those sectors. So 29% of the fund 
is in the category we'd all expect. Companies that launch, make, service or operate platforms in the orbital space. And that would include satellites and launch vehicles to get the satellites up there in the first place. Now to get into orbit you have to go beyond a critical velocity called the escape velocity and that's why you need a rocket. But there's actually a market for suborbital space companies. So if you want to go up to the edge of space as a space tourist you don't actually have to be put into orbit which requires a huge amount of energy and fuel. It's much cheaper just to take you to the edge of space. You float around a little bit at zero G and it's kind of fun. Maybe you vomit and then you come back down. And so Virgin might be one of these examples of a suborbital aerospace company. I think what's disappointed a lot of space nerds, such as myself, is that SpaceX is not part of the fund. And that's because SpaceX is still a private company. It's not traded on an exchange. And that means its stocks aren't available to buy for this ETF. Now that's not always going to be true. It may be that SpaceX decides to do an IPO or uses a SPAC to go public. And if that does happen, you can bet that this fund will buy a lot of that stock. But certainly for now, no SpaceX. A quarter of the fund, as we saw, is in enabling technologies. So that would be companies which create software for artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, materials, and energy storage. All of these are required if you have to have a footprint in space. And one of the companies which is owned in this category is called Teradyne. And you can almost think of this as the plumbing behind the scenes which makes aerospace technology work. Another thing which surprised some people, which is that if you buy the ETF ARCX, you actually own 6% of another ETF created by ARC called PRNT, which is a 3D printing ETF. So whether you're in orbit, or whether you're on the moon, or whether you're on Mars, it's going to be really useful to have some kind of 3D printing technology. So it kind of does make sense that ARC uses its own fund, because they've already figured out which stocks are good ones to represent this 3D printing theme. But it certainly did raise some eyebrows when they included such a large weight for PRNT. But the reason why this fund was the butt of so many jokes was because of this final category, which makes up 40% of the fund. And these are the aerospace beneficiary companies. And in fact, you'd probably be hard pushed to find a company which doesn't depend on aerospace technology in some way. So for example, anything which requires navigation or working out your position will depend on GPS, which would depend on aerospace activity. But the justification for including Netflix is actually really interesting. Now personally, what I found really surprising was that 42 million Americans do not have access to broadband. I guess if you live in rural America, that's probably why you wouldn't have access. But for example, SpaceX is creating a network called Starlink so that even these remote locations will always be able to see satellites in the sky which are in fairly low Earth orbit. Previously we depended on geostationary satellites for communications but their orbit is much further out and that actually produces a delay in the signal. So it simply wouldn't work for things like broadband. And if you work out how much that could generate in terms of fees every year, in the US alone it would generate about $10 billion a year. And globally, ARC expects that it would be about $40 billion per year. So their point is that if we do get systems like Starlink from SpaceX, then Netflix will be able to stream to a much wider audience, and that means its revenue would increase. So there is a kind of nice justification, I think, for including Netflix, even though it did make for some very funny memes. Another surprise with this fund is the profitability of the companies in which it invests. So each of these columns you can see here is one of ARC's funds. The one just here is ARCX. ARCF is the FinTech Innovation ETF. ARCK is their main fund, their Innovation ETF. And ARCG is the Genomic Revolution ETF to do with biotechnology. And what these bars represent is how profitable each of the companies are which make up the fund. So if you see a big red bar, that means the company's making a big loss in the previous 12 months. And if you see a big blue bar, that means the company is profitable. Now notice how these two graphs on the right for ARCK and ARCG have many unprofitable companies. But what's really notable about ARCX is that most of its companies are profitable. In fact, there are only a handful of them which aren't profitable. So I think that's one of the things that sets it apart 
from at least some of the other funds which are created by ARK. It also stands out if we look at valuation. So here are the 100 stocks in the NASDAQ 100, and here on the right hand side of the graph is where you'd be if you were an expensive stock. And the measure I've used here is kind of like price to sales ratio. And if you're over here on the left, those would be companies which are relatively cheap. They have a low price to sales ratio. But the reason why I'm showing you this is to give you a reasonable valuation. So that would be around 8.2%. If we do the same plot for some of these ARK funds, and these are organized in the same order that they were for the previous graph, you can see that ARK K and ARK G tend to have very expensive companies. So here for ARK K, all of the companies from here on upwards go from 12% enterprise value to turnover, all the way up to over 20,000% for this measure. And ARC G is similarly expensive. But again, what's notable about ARC X is that the companies really aren't that expensive. In fact, most of them are roughly in line with valuations for the NASDAQ. So is the launch of this fund simply clever marketing from ARC? Now, each of these bars that you can see beneath me are the quarterly returns for one of these ARC funds. We don't have any history for ARCX, so we can't make a direct comparison. But in a previous video, I showed how the returns were pretty good historically, but not spectacular until we got to the year 2020. And then in three successive quarters in 2020, ARC had simply spectacular returns. It's not many times in your life when you see a fund in three successive quarters returning 61%, 28% and then 35%. And it was kind of inevitable that that wouldn't last. In fact, that's what I said in my previous review. And sure enough, in this quarter, the best return of these four was 10%, with ARC W just about breaking even, and ARC G and ARC K making a quarterly loss. And if instead of absolute returns, we compare the returns with the NASDAQ, which is kind of a techie equivalent of ARK funds, a reasonable benchmark in fact, ARK G and ARK K have underperformed the NASDAQ in this quarter. Now, unfortunately, it's the case that many people chase performance. When returns are kind of mediocre, you can see that for a long time, there wasn't much inflow into ARK funds. But then once we had those periods with extremely high returns, there were massive inflows. Lots of people were buying the funds because they were chasing return. But then suddenly everything went from green to red. There were some very big outflows as the returns of the fund started to falter and then actually underperform. So if you were cynical, you might think that the launch of a new fund was simply to get some more inflows and a bit more love for ARK itself. And certainly, as Nate Gerasi says here in a tweet, ARKX took in a huge amount of money on its first day, $281 million. So obviously there are lots of space buffs out there like me who were quite willing to give Kathy Woods their money, even though some of the stock selection seemed a little bit odd. So if you are cynical, perhaps you think that this was just a marketing ploy. And personally, my opinion is that if I wanted to buy a space fund, this is not that fund. I would be quite willing to buy something like SpaceX, but of course I can't buy that just as Kathy Woods can't buy that. So personally, if I wanted space exploration, I wouldn't buy this fund. What is interesting is that it isn't a purely growth fund. It does have some aspects of value in it. So as interest rates increase, this one might do a little bit better than the more growth oriented funds like ARK K and ARK G. So if you do want to learn more about investing, a great way to do that is as part of our Patreon community. There should be a link in the description below me and beside me if you want to learn more about that. And if you do, there's lots of members only video content which is available. You can vote on that content and you can join us on Slack and ask questions of me and other members of the community at any time. So please do consider joining us on Patreon. It's a great way to learn about investing. And as always, thank you for listening.